I'm today going to talk about nuclear luck. And by nuclear luck, I mean the ability of the world so far huh, to have avoided using any nuclear weapon since Nagasaki and to have avoided unauthorized or accidental use of a nuclear weapon, which could have been catastrophic in its own right. Many people, most notably those in authority who command and control nuclear systems, and those who have been in high office, believe that this was not a matter of luck, but more of skill. The combination of thoughtful and well-applied procedures, the ability of leaders to manage conflict, and particularly crises, is what has brought us to this stage, um, well, I can easily calculate how many years after 1945, because I was four years old um, at the time. So it's uh, close to 80 years of avoidance of nuclear catastrophe is not a matter <coughs> of luck. Forgive me for a second. I'm just getting over a sinus condition. Their critics, on the other hand, of whom I'm one, argue that there was a significant degree of luck involved. Uh, the implications of this dispute are not merely academic, uh, but have profound uh, implications for policy. If indeed it was skill and thought and organization and leadership, then we can be reasonably confident that for the next 50, 60, or 70 years, um, we can avoid a catastrophe. If it was luck, then we have to be a bit more cautious in our expectations. And indeed, it only takes one unlucky outcome to do a lot of disaster. If we look at the Cold War era, we know that we came close. There are any number of close nuclear accidents. Uh, perhaps the one that gets the most attention is the Glassboro, North Carolina, incident where a B-52 armed with uh, three uh, megaton bombs uh, broke up in midair. The bombs fell. They didn't go off. They had six uh, checks on preventing them from exploding. Five failed. And the six succeeded only because a fuse didn't work. So in the end, it was an accident that prevented an accident. When we look at nuclear crises, the closest we came, I think, was in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there's lots of evidence that we came very close, much closer than anybody on either side thought at the time. Uh, I'm going to argue today is that people are very bad in making estimates of contingency, risk, and luck. Uh, secondly, that we need to make a fundamental distinction between what the University of Chicago economist Frank Knight in the 1920s uh, called between risk and uncertainty. Risk are situations where we can estimate with some degree of confidence the probability of an outcome, uh, so much so that we can state it mathematically. Classic example being lotteries. Huh? Your chance of winning a lottery, assuming it's fair, uh, has to do with the number of people who buy tickets. Well, and you can readily figure your chance of winning. Uncertainty are situations where we can't estimate risk. The best we can do is speculate about it. 
And I'll argue that one of the problems encouraged by both social science and policymakers who often conspire together uh, toward this end is to treat situations of uncertainty as risk. And my third point will be that this move, while it's very good professionally and intellectually and satisfying to many people, actually increases the likelihood of bad luck. And certainly when dealing with nuclear systems, it is the last thing we wish to do. So um, where do we begin? Let's start with what psychological experiments tell us about the ability of not only ordinary people, but experts to assess what kind of world they're living in, one of risk or uncertainty, and to assess the contingency in both of those worlds. Uh, in brief, it's not very good. Huh? Uh, people in general uh, have little knowledge of statistics, uh, don't understand how base rates work. A classic example here that I think you'll find interesting are doctors. For many, many years, uh, doctors ignored base rates. So they'd be told that a particular treatment has a 64% chance uh, in a patient diagnosed correctly with this particular ailment. Uh, doctors would rarely diagnose on the basis of the base rate because it reduced their agency and authority. They all argued that their clinical judgment gave them extra insight, and they would make judgments based on that, ignoring the base rate. Afterwards, or if interviewed about this, they'd of course point to all the cases where they were right, conveniently having forgotten those where they were wrong. Robin Dawes back in the early 60s, did a number of studies to prove that if you simply followed the base rates, you would have done significantly better than doctors did across a series of illnesses in prescribing um, treatments. So this is a problem with professionals. It, it extends itself uh, further, and this is a, another key point that I wish to make, is that when people assess whether a situation is one of risk or uncertainty, and it's very hard to get them to distinguish between the two, uh, that rather than trying to make an estimate based on what evidence is available, their tendency rather is to start with their prior assumptions, beliefs, and expectations and interpret the evidence accordingly. So it becomes uh, tautologically confirmed, and once it's in their mind, it then guides um, policy. They're also readily manipulable. And here, let me describe some experiments that I've conducted together with uh, Phil Tetlock uh, toward uh, this end. Uh, one has to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we conducted counterfactual experiments with policymakers, and our sample were drawn from members of the Council on Foreign Relations, who are people who address on a professional basis international relations. And secondly, we had a sample from members of the International Studies Association, overwhelmingly scholars, huh? who, like us, um, who study international relations. And what we did was to ask them in the first instrument, what was the likelihood that the Cuban Missile Crisis would end as it did, peacefully and without war? Then we engaged in counterfactuals. Our second instrument offered three different possible outcomes for the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, two of them violent and two not. Our next instrument unpacked our counterfactuals by giving three reasons why each of these other three outcomes might have occurred. 
And finally, we had a fourth instrument which embedded the information in instrument number three in a narrative, which gave irrelevant information, like the weather and the names of people involved and the names of ships and all kinds of things which really had little bearing on the outcome. We then asked people to assess the outcomes. And of course, they got different instruments. And lo and behold, the more vivid the counterfactual, in other words, the more it was unpacked, sometimes with information, but sometimes just with the narrative, the higher the estimate of contingency went. Until finally, in the last uh, instrument number four, where the participants had to make an estimate for each of the three outcomes plus the real one, the total came to 124%. So a violation of the rules of statistics, but also showing the great susceptibility to counterfactual manipulation. In a second study that I carried out, I asked historians to assess the likelihood of World War I in 1914, in 1900, in 1870, and in 1815. And of course, the more you moved away from the crisis, the less likely it was. But what I did with this experiment, to one part of the sample, I asked it in positive terms. So what was the likelihood of war happening? And in the other, I asked what was the likelihood of war being prevented? So logically equivalent statements. But put differently, and I got a completely different curve. So even the professionals can be manipulated, and professionals are likely to see what they want. And here, too, uh, Tetlock and I have done an interesting experiment. Uh, we developed a test for what we call cognitive closure. So to what extent do people want to or need to believe that the world is ordered and predictable? In other words, that they're living in an environment of risk. In contrast to people who prefer or need to believe the world as highly unpredictable and uncertain. In other words, a world of uncertainty. And what we found when we analyzed international relations scholars on the one hand and policymakers on the other was considerable variance. That policymakers, we sort of got a curve. International relations scholars, we found at the two extremes. And each of these, when we use counterfactuals to prime them to think about contingency of events, responded in very different ways. Uh, those who saw the world as ordered and predictable were perfectly willing to accept counterfactuals that unmade cases that were discrepant with their view of the world or favorite theory, but rejected those which changed cases which they used to support or build their theories. And this wasn't so with people who were willing to accept uncertainty. So we seem to be wired uh, in somewhat different ways. Huh? And of course, we're also motivated to see things in important ways. And here, there's again um, evidence that suggests that people and policymakers and scholars need to see the world in causal terms. And they need to see it in causal terms because then it can be explained, possibly predicted, it makes them feel more secure. They also are motivated to tell certain kinds of stories about events. If the outcome is good and they've been involved, they attribute it to their skill. If the outcome is bad and they've been involved, it was luck. So there's this very strong uh, correlation um, that fits here. 
And even policymakers uh, fall into traps uh, when you quiz them about this. So Rick Herman and I uh, conducted a series of interviews with European, American, and at the time Soviet policymakers who were involved in ending the Cold War. And we reasoned that there were a series of steps that led to the end of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviets pulling out of Afghanistan, uh, agreeing to arms control agreements with the West, allowing Eastern Europe to go its own way politically, and finally, the unification of Germany. Oh, the first one was the selection of Gorbachev as, as general secretary. And we asked the policymakers how much these events were the result of luck or of skill. And they all said that uh, they were mixed about whether it was luck or skill, but it was all predetermined. It had to happen the way it did. And therefore, in the end, they recognized, or they said, that there was no luck with respect to the outcome. It wasn't contingent in any way. We then interviewed them. And to the extent that they were involved in any one of these events that led to the end of the Cold War, um, they told us that if this hadn't happened, if I hadn't had a close relationship with my American or Soviet counterpart, uh, if Matthias Rust hadn't landed in Red Square, it would have worked out differently. So at the micro level, they believed in contingency and luck, but not at the, micro, at the macro level. And when we confronted them with this, they couldn't grapple with it. They, 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 they really struggled. And you'll see, even if you try to do as professional and objective job as you might, it's exceedingly difficult. So let's take two cases, Trump's election and the outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you can tell different narratives, and you can make good cases for these different narratives. For Trump, you could argue he was the right man in the right place, but he was there because of his skill. He overwhelmed a field of Republican candidates who appealed to roughly the same demographic, that it was his in-your-face attitude, uh, his aggressiveness, uh, which made him appealing to a particular group of alienated voters, as did his campaign slogan, Make America Great. Uh, people were willing to vote for somebody whom they saw as antithetical and hostile to the establishment. And maybe this is the same reason why so many people in Britain voted for Brexit. However, uh, you can argue that his election was luck. So Trump tried to run for president eight years earlier. He got absolutely nowhere. His personality was the same. His arguments were the same. His appeal was the same. Republican voters wouldn't give him very much support. He never came close to winning the nomination and had to withdraw. We can then turn to the election. The Republicans won the presidency by three percentage points. The public opinion polls revealed that it was in the last days, or if not week of the election, <coughs> that the shift of three percentage points occurred. Hillary Clinton and her supporters argue this was attributable to Russian interference in the election and FBI directors Comey announcement that the FBI was investigating Hillary Clinton. This shifted public opinion. Nate Silva, who writes for the New York Times, who's an avowed Democrat and uh, one of the most respected authorities of election data, says no, offers the counterfactual that if neither of these events had occurred, there still would have been a three-point shift. So even with data and good election data, People who are open-minded and serious can't agree among themselves the extent of contingency here and whether what happened uh, was lucky or not. And we'll leave aside the question of whether it was good luck or bad luck because that very clearly depends upon your values. 
If we come to the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's even more um, problematic. So in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, uh, Kennedy uh, told McNamara that we were really lucky. He thought the chances between one and three and even that the Russians would have gone to war. By contrast, the hawks on the XCOM, people like Dean Acheson, who actually resigned from the XCOM because he thought Kennedy was weak and vacillating, uh, Dean Rusk, uh, all of the generals, even uh, McGeorge Bundy at the time, thought that the outcome was foreordained, that there was no element of luck whatsoever, that the Soviets were outgunned, that they knew it, that they had no choice but to give in. If Khrushchev had resisted, the Soviet leaders would have shot him and put somebody sensible in power to reach an accommodation with the United States. In the aftermath of the missile crisis, we have a lot more information. And we know, for example, that uh, in several ways, the superpowers came close to war, a war, by the way, that neither Soviet nor American leaders uh, wanted. Uh, perhaps uh, the best example has to do with the Cuban forces in Cuba, excuse me, the Soviet forces in Cuba. The CIA estimated that there were 10,000 of them, that they were mostly there to train the Cubans. In fact, the Soviets had a military brigade of 42,000 people, and they were armed with lunar missiles equipped with nuclear warheads and with advance orders to fire them on an American invasion fleet. Now, as you know, the Hawks were pushing Kennedy into an airstrike and made it clear to him if they carried out an airstrike, they couldn't guarantee that all the missiles would be destroyed. So instead, or in addition, they needed an invasion. And had the Americans opted for the invasion, it seems very likely that some of those warheads would have been aimed at American ships, that the American invasion force would have been sunk or seriously damaged, the pressure on Kennedy to carry out some nuclear reprisal against the Soviet Union would have been great. And uh, as we say in this country, und so weiter, we don't know where um, it, would, it would end up. So we reflect back on this. We still have the same two sides making the same arguments. We have the rationalists, led by Thomas Schelling and his followers, arguing that there was no luck at all. And we have those who follow the Kennedy-McNamara line, who cite this and other examples of uh, almost war as evidence that there was a high degree of luck. And Thomas Schelling is particularly interesting in this regard because he's made a famous argument, which many strategists uh, follow, of the risk that leaves something to chance. He contends that the Americans won the missile crisis, which is best described as an escalating set of risk taking. Each side would go up the ladder, accepting more risk until somebody yelled uncle because the risk would be too much. He argues that was the Soviets because the Americans had such clear conventional superiority in the Caribbean and an overall strategic nuclear uh, superiority. But the Schelling story, while you know, facile and, and seemingly rational, means that one or both sides have some notion of knowing what the risk was. Huh? because no side would have gone up to the point where war became highly likely or unavoidable. We know in retrospect that Khrushchev gave in because he was terribly fearful that he was losing control and war would break out. Kennedy was prepared to give in for exactly the same reasons and had made the secret offer to Khrushchev to withdraw the Jupiter missiles from Turkey at a decent interval. So the outcome was, in fact, closer to a compromise. Khrushchev 
started a crisis not thinking he was starting one. He completely estimated, misestimated the risk involved of putting missiles in Cuba. Uh, Kennedy uh, may have exaggerated the risks of attacking the missiles, but maybe not. And here, too, there are two storylines that follow. Even in retrospect, the risk levels of any step of escalation are unknowable. And what's happened with analysts and historians who have looked at the same historical evidence is they've come up with diametrically opposed stories because they assimilate that evidence to their pre-existing beliefs about how the world works or their political preferences. Learning requires some understanding of what has happened in the past. However, if we interpret the past on the basis of tautological understandings that confirm our beliefs, we're not really learning. And we may convince ourselves that we don't face such great uh, risk in the future, but that may be a delusion. And if we do that, we may make ourselves more susceptible to the kinds of catastrophic outcomes that we're trying to prevent. And this then brings me to the issue of uncertainty and risk, which I broached at the beginning of my talk, saying that uh, risk are those situations where you can really calculate the probabilities of outcomes and assess, therefore, the contingency of the outcome you want. And I used, um, what's the word for uh, raffles, uh, as, as an example. But consider diseases. Uh, there's also uncertainty in situations of risk. So we know, for example, that people who are correctly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have a 2% chance of survival after five years. So we have a base rate. We can make a probability, but that's a probability about a population. We can say nothing about an individual. And yet, it's the individuals that matter. So even having a base rate leaves enormous uncertainty about what's going to happen to you. Now, not in the case of pancreatic cancer, where there's a 98% chance you'll die, but if you have a disease where, let's say, there's a 50% chance you'll survive, you can't possibly know. And so think about international relations theory and come to somebody like Ken Waltz. Do I have another five or six minutes? Easy. Think about Ken Waltz. He wrote this book, and I never understood why anybody could ever take it seriously. It only has one single claim. That is that um, bipolar systems are less war-prone than multipolar systems, and he gives you a reason why. It doesn't tell you how much more or less or more war-prone they are. To even test his theory, he claims it's science, but it's not because the number of bipolar systems we've had in the world is very few. In fact, I don't think we've had any. I think everyone he describes was not bipolar. But even if you had three or four, it's not enough to do any kind of statistical test. And, and this is the key point, we're only interested, when we read Ken Waltz, in one bipolar system, and that was the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And base rates, which he can't provide, tell us nothing about this one case. So this kind of information is useless when we deal with what are known as singular events. And I submit that in politics and international relations, it's overwhelmingly singular events with which we deal. The Industrial Revolution, you know, we don't have 800 other worlds that had or didn't have an industrial revolution, so we can try to figure out why it happened. And we only have a few in our world if we ask why it didn't start in, let's say, China or Japan. And these other cases are very useful for historians to analyze, but there's really no way of coming to uh, a, a thorough assessment of it. 
The same is true with global warming. We're playing Schelling's game here, aren't we? A risk that leaves something to chance. Huh? And we don't know. It's a single case, but it's also a single case with a host of uncertainties. And to use uh, Donald Rumsfeld's famous term, there are known unknowns, but many more unknown unknowns which may influence the outcome. The British are doing something similar with Brexit. If you think about it, they're playing the shelling game of the risk that leaves something to chance. And if you look at how they're assessing it, they're convinced that at the last moment, the same way Dean Russ said, we were eyeball to eyeball and the other side just blinked. They're convinced that the EU will blink. And why? You listen to the Tories and they say the EU has so much to lose economically from Britain cashing out, crashing out, rather, of the EU. Well, they recognize that Britain has even more to lose from doing this. But they'll all tell you, Brexit isn't about economics. It's about identity. It's about reclaiming sovereignty. It's about nostalgia for being Britain. It never occurs to them that the EU leaders may be behaving in a similar way and that economic considerations may not be paramount for them either. That there are a whole host of other considerations that are much more important. So risks that leave something to chance are, they leave everything to chance because we can't estimate the risk properly and politicians especially are bad in doing so either because they project their values onto the other side and make mistakes, as happened in 1914 and 1941, or they fail to project their values onto the other side, as the British have failed to do in the case of Brexit. So politicians are even worse than scholars in making these assessments because they're highly motivated, they're emotionally aroused, and they are fundamentally irrational. So if the British avoid a hard Brexit, I will put money on it now that the result will be due to luck and not uh, to skill. Second point with uncertainty and risk is that economists and social scientists feel at home in a world of risk and feel threatened by worlds of uncertainty where they can't model it, they can't do what social science is supposed to do. So like Schelling, what they do is to delude themselves that worlds of uncertainty are really worlds of risk. And what I'm arguing in the paper, and I give a more elaborate defense of my position than I could in a lecture here, is to argue that for reasons of singular events, uh, for reasons of single cases that we're interested in, even where we have base rates, and thirdly, because of the irrational nature of the assumptions and behavior of actors, that politics and even more international relations lives in a world of uncertainty. And by falsely describing a world of uncertainty as a world of risk, you make bad luck more rather than less likely. So if we come back and conclude with nuclear luck, Americans and Russians, and presumably now Indians and Pakistanis and Chinese and Israelis and the French, uh, are all convinced that their command and control procedures work very well. And they're convinced, A, because there's been no accident, and B, because they frame them as technical systems. Right? And technical systems, they think, live in the world of risk. But in crisis, it's human interactions with technical systems and humans who are emotionally aroused 
that create a very different world of uncertainty. And to the extent to which you don't study this interaction and begin to think about some of the bad outcomes that might come about, you make those outcomes more likely in situations of emotional arousal and acute crisis. Policymakers, and again, encouraged by most of the strategic community, have convinced themselves that deterrence not only prevented World War III, but brought about the Soviet capitulation. Now, there's strong evidence that neither of these claims are true, that the Cold War ended in spite of Star Wars, not because of it, that deterrence provoked the most serious crises of the Cold War, that self-deterrence was effective. Leaders on all sides were terrified of the use of nuclear weapons. And one ex-American president told me that there was no condition in which he ever would have launched a nuclear weapon. Even if he said the Soviet Union had attacked, he said, I thought about this deeply. And if I ordered retaliation, I would kill more people than Hitler and Mao Zedong combined, and Stalin, and 99.999% of them innocent folk who had nothing to do with a Soviet nuclear attack. He said, I wouldn't do it. And these fears um, were shared. But by thinking that it's deterrence, and by thinking that it's certain kinds of deterrence and credible threats, not recognizing their consequences for the other side, that produce the crises that make nuclear accidents or nuclear war more likely. So social science, uh, rather than being a tool to help us work through and identify problems and reduce the chance of bad luck, actually function in a way to make bad luck more likely. I'll stop here. <clears throat>
who is less risk averse than, than others. I can't imagine war. whom you might have in mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you have a warmonger in power who's rather willing to press the button than someone else, um, then that is not so much luck and skill, but rather, again, of human nature. So what do you see? Um, what's the role of human nature there? Thank you. Thank you. And then we have <clears throat> room for one more in the first batch. Who wants to ask a question? I'm Sarah Ann Arab, and I'm also a student here at the Diplomatic Academy. Sorry, I'm right here. Thank you. Um, and my question is, what do you think policymakers should do, given um, your point of view? So, what? So, if you were to be prescriptive, what would you say to policymakers? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. These these are these are three very good questions. Let me respond in order, and let me start with uh, Noah's question about technology. Huh? So there's a very good book by Charles, known as Chick Perot, P-E-R-R-O-W, -R called Normal Accidents, published back in, oh, maybe 1984 or six. And he looks at accidents in complex technical systems. Uh, airplane crashes, uh, Three Mile Island, uh, various other uh, problems. And he argues that one of the inherent features of tightly coupled complex technologies is that they never work the way they're supposed to, and that if the operators follow the rules and procedures that are laid down, then the systems are even less likely to work. So what happens everywhere is operators make informal arrangements among themselves to basically bypass uh, a number of the procedures, including those aspects of it which may build in controls to prevent things from happening. And that this creates a propensity for disaster that's never understood by either the people who made the system or those who monitor it because all their models of interaction are based on the assumption that their procedures will be followed. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is that when something goes wrong, it almost invariably goes wrong in ways that were not perceived beforehand. And it only becomes apparent ex post facto what actually has happened. So operators of the system in real time who have to make judgments frequently misunderstand what's happening and may in fact intervene in ways to prevent catastrophe that make it happen. Uh, and he documents this again. I mean, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl both provide uh, very strong evidence of this as do um, uh, various aircraft um, disasters. So. There is um, uh, an element of uh, organizational behavior uh, and uh, human psychology that combines to interact with these systems in very unpredictable and even nonlinear ways. The people who build and study the systems uh, refuse to acknowledge this. Oh, and I should have noted that the Fukushima Japanese nuclear plant is again a classic example of all of these things happening um, at once. And there's a great reluctance to do it because it would suggest that certain kinds of systems can't be designed to avoid these problems. But authorities and engineers or m military people want the systems. So they, they downplay the risks. And this is, this is a very serious problem. Um, the second issue has to do with, um, and this is Max's question, um, has to do with human nature um, and, and risk. So we have to be very careful, as I'm sure you understand, in how we use human nature. I mean, often, and Hegel was, I think, the first to observe this, that um, how people describe human nature often tells you more about the people than it does about human nature. Uh, 
since we're a grab bag of so many diverse and different qualities, and what comes out is often a function of socialization and, and context. Uh, but what you're really talking about are personalities. Huh? And we have ample evidence of the importance of agency uh, cutting both ways in these situations. So, bad leadership, case in point, Kaiser Wilhelm in 1914. A man in many ways uh, reminiscent of Donald Trump, huh? terribly insecure, huh? full of bluster, uh, behaved like a, I won't even say a teenager, a child um, out of control, had constantly to be um, constrained. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Kaiser lived in an era before tweets, uh, or no doubt he would have done, done the same. At the height of the July crisis, where a decision might have been made, he suffered what psychiatrists call a dissociative reaction. His defenses were so overwhelmed, he couldn't cope with it, and he took himself outside of reality for a full 24 hours uh, for his psyche to readjust. He sat in a corner, staring into space in Potsdam, out of contact, unable to make decisions at the critical moment of the crisis. And we know this happened to Stalin, too, in 1941, who had denied the possibility of a German invasion, had rejected out of hand all the information that came that uh, uh, indicated that the Germans were on the verge of invasion. And as a result, the initial Soviet response was a disaster and extremely costly uh, to the Soviet Union. By contrast, we have Kennedy and Khrushchev. Khrushchev miscalculated. Khrushchev came to realize he had miscalculated, that he would have to climb down and to avoid war, make concessions. Kennedy at the outset was furious with Khrushchev. The first words he uttered when being told when he awoke in the morning by McGeorge Bundy that missiles had been found in Cuba was, he can't do that to me. He took it personally, he was furious. The tapes of the XCOM indicate that for the first 24 hours, John Kennedy, an enormously articulate, thoughtful man, could not complete a simple declarative sentence. He kept interrupting himself. His thoughts went in different directions. Everybody on the XCOM whom I interviewed said that if Kennedy had had to make a decision in the first 24 hours, without doubt he would have ordered an airstrike and an invasion. You know, had he done that, I think it's likely there would have been some kind of nuclear exchange. Now, Kennedy fortunately had a week to come to his senses, uh, which he did. By the end of the week, he was joking um, about things. Uh, he was in control. Uh, he was willing to make concessions to end the crisis, even if it cost him the presidency. So Kennedy and Khrushchev ended up rising to the level of great leaders and were willing to sacrifice their own personal careers to save the peace of the world, unlike most of the leaders of 1914. So it's, it's hit or miss. And fortunately, in Cuba, we had uh, two leaders of the right stature, and one can readily conduct counterfactuals and imagine other leaders in power behaving very differently. Um, the third issue, uh, or the third question is from Erica about uh, policy advice. Well, the, the principal bit of advice I'd give is recognizing the distinction between risk um, and certainty. I mean, you know, if you think about it in, in the German language, if you use uh, chance, uh, it, it actually carries two meanings. Um, it's uh, Wahrscheinlichkeit and also Möglichkeit. And one is risk and the other is uncertainty. Uh, in English, we don't have um, this division. But I've argued that it's an essential division and leaders have to be very wary about the kinds of estimates and probabilities given them to them by their advisors and to recognize that if you're living in the land of uncertainty, all of this is arrant nonsense, huh? that you're floating in an unknown environment, that you have to exercise far more caution uh, 
than others would tell you or that you would might, given the nature of the problems that you face. And the second piece of advice, which is more specific, has to do with how complex technical systems function, and all the more so when their operators are in emotionally aroused states. Thank you. Now we can move to the second round. Mahmoud, yeah. My name is Mahmoud. Uh, I too am a student of the Umar Academy. Professor, thank you for your talk. Um, my question you, you talked about how some scholars thought it was luck, others were, uh, thought it was skill. Where do you stand on this uh, debate personally? With regard to with regard to Cuba or uh, nuclear Cuba, nuclear yes. war, no, Cuba. Cuba. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm also a student at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, I was just wondering whether, considering the developments in the past years and decades, do you think nuclear disarmament has become more likely or less likely? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm also a student here at the Diplomatic Academy. Thank I you very I much. I can't see. Which one is Tom? Thank you. Um, and I'm interested in time-sensitive decision-making. I mean, already when you have to make global decisions, there's a lot of variables which you have to consider. Well, when it's time-sensitive, for instance, when nuclear weapons uh, fly toward the country and you have to make a decision, there are a lot of variables which you have to ignore. So isn't there always a large degree of luck involved in making successful, time-sensitive decisions? Sorry. A yes, such as answering questions from students in a situation like this. Uh, there's luck in the question you get and also which variables you choose to bring as answers. But I I'll give you a more serious answer as well. So let me come first to Mahmoud. Um, was Cuba the result of luck or skill? Uh, I would argue both. Huh? I give Kennedy and Khrushchev, as I noted, a considerable credit uh, for rising to the occasion. Khrushchev for recognizing he had made a terrible mistake, uh, for trying to figure out a way of getting out of this situation. Kennedy for taking the time to work through the decision, to try to get as much information as he could, to probe and ask tough questions to the generals and hawks who were pushing him into an airstrike or an invasion, and for, as I noted, uh, his willingness to make concessions which might have led to his impeachment or certainly the loss of the upcoming congressional election for the Democrats. And most notably, uh, there's a kind of secret text as to how this conflict was resolved. In contrast to Tom Schelling and so many of the books that argue that it was American military superiority and the quarantine which raised the threat of war but cleverly didn't do anything violent that convinced the Soviets of American resolve and made them back down. That's the standard narrative. Uh, <coughs> Janice Stein and I have made a very different case uh, in a book called We All Lost the Cold War, uh, which often got badly reviewed because critics were furious with the title. We argue that the missile crisis was resolved primarily through um, reassurance that indeed uh, the quarantine sent the signal that the Americans uh, had resolve and would not give in, but Kennedy came to the understanding that Khrushchev was likely to have miscalculated, and that if he found a way to let him back down without loss of face, it was more likely he would make a concession. And Khrushchev, at the end of the crisis, told his son-in-law, Alexei Adjubai, and forgive me if I'm crude here, but I'm quoting Khrushchev, he said, uh, Kennedy had me by the balls, but he didn't squeeze. He was convinced at, up to this point uh, 
that Kennedy was simply a tool of Wall Street, and Wall Street would use the crisis to go to war. Kennedy didn't do this. So Kennedy created a situation where Khrushchev could back down with minimal loss of face. He made the kind of secret exchange that let Khrushchev present it to the Politburo as closer to a 50-50 uh, split. And most importantly, the, before the crisis, both the Soviet Union and the United States had symmetrical images of the other. They believed that they were peace-loving, but the other side was willing to go to war. The Cuban Missile Crisis convinced the top American leadership that the Soviets feared war as much as they did. And the Americans came to believe that the Soviets feared war as much as they did. It paved the way for detente. And with it, the reduction of risk of another crisis like Cuba. So in that sense, uh, cleverness paid off, but there was a hell of a lot of luck involved. There was luck that it was Kennedy and Khrushchev. Huh? There was luck that they pursued clever strategies. And there was also luck that they both greatly exaggerated at the height of the crisis the risk of war, which is what made them hasten to make their concessions. And do I have two minutes to tell yes. a couple of stories about this? So on the American side, that Saturday, when the XCOM met at the White House, the first piece of information that they received was that the Soviets in the Washington Embassy were burning their papers. Now, this was horrifying to the Americans because the FBI, on the morning of December 6, 1941, had reported that the Japanese were burning their papers, and the Americans hadn't figured out what this meant. So with this precedent in mind, it seemed terrifying. Then the next thing that happened was a news arrived that a U-2 plane had been shot down over Cuba, as pilot presumably killed. This looked like Moscow was getting tough, upping the ante. Maybe Khrushchev had been pushed aside. Evidence for which was also a ship that seemed to have detached itself from the block, from the Soviets milling outside the blockade line and was charging toward the blockade line. Well, we know the U-2 was shot down by a Soviet battery that General Pliev, in charge of the anti-aircraft forces in Cuba, ignored orders directly from Khrushchev and Defense Minister Rodion Malinovsky not to fire at the Americans unless an invasion actually began. Castro convinced him otherwise, so he violated orders. But the Americans worried about all kinds of loss of control on their end. It never occurred to them that this might be Soviet loss of control. They put this together with the burning of the papers and the ship moving away from the blockade line as signals from the Soviets that they were getting ready to go to war. So Kennedy was even more willing to settle. On the Soviet side, all kinds of things convinced Khrushchev that the Americans were about to attack. And I won't go into a long song and dance, but I'll give you the most absurd but seemingly the most important piece of information in this regard. When Khrushchev sent through Radio Moscow the message that he would withdraw the missiles from Cuba, uh, it was Sunday morning in the U.S., and Kennedy came out of his private quarters and heard the news from McGeorge Bundy. Uh, Bobby came out. They were all thrilled to hear this. Kennedy said, wonderful. John Kennedy said, uh, well, actually, two things happened. He said, I can't wait to tell Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe, the news. And Bobby said, no, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Jack said, I'm going to church, and he and Kenny Donald went off to church. The KGB was tailing the president throughout the crisis and saw that he went to church. And they had a radio that could send messages to Moscow. And they said, the president's gone to church to pray for the last minute courage to launch a nuclear attack. And people in Moscow believed that rather than celebrating that there was now peace, that Kennedy was going to go to war. So this irrational uh, understanding 
on both sides of signals being misinterpreted and of noise being interpreted as signals. But fortunately, and by sheer luck, it had the effect of intensifying the desires of both leaders to make the concessions to avoid war. And just as easily, it could have gone a different way, as we know it did in 1914 or some other cases. So it's skill and luck, and trying to unravel them is a very useful exercise from which important lessons um, can be learned. Um, disarmament. Um, I'll answer that question, although I, I, it doesn't grow out of anything that I've said in, in today's talk. Um, I think the chances of disarmament are declining. Uh, there's the makings of a possible new Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, especially now that arms control uh, is, is, is dead. Uh, proliferation um, continues. There's been no effort, serious effort to stop it, and there won't be if the major powers are acquiring more nuclear weapons. So in the absence of disarmament, with more weapons and with more actors having them, the chance of surviving becomes increasingly dependent on luck. And finally, the question of time sensitivity. Uh, it's clearly very important. The longer one has for any kind of decision, uh, the more thoughtful you can be about it, the more evidence you can gather. This doesn't necessarily mean you'll make a good decision, but it's more likely if you have to make a gut decision in an instant that you won't make a good one. There's also some psychological research here, and most notably the work of Irving Janis. And if you look at his uh, book with Leon Mann on conflict um, decision-making, uh, he finds that if you discover your policy is failing and going to lead to really bad outcomes you know, for you and others, two conditions determine how you respond. Well, really three. If you can find a better alternative, there's no problem. You just shift from A to B, assuming you have the personality to do that. Now, if you happen to be somebody like Theresa May, who we know from people who know her all of her life, is incapable of making a decision, and then once she does, incapable of moving away from it, uh, knowledge that you're heading toward disaster may simply be denied. So here again, personality comes in. If uh, you can't find a seemingly successful alternative, you're likely to deny the information, to distort, to discredit it, simply to ignore it, because the political psychological threat of acknowledging <clears throat> that you're heading toward disaster but have no way of preventing it is unacceptable. The other response, and you see this, uh, for example, on highways where there are toll booths, people have to make decisions under little stress because they're going very fast, especially in places like Germany where there's no speed limit. And there may be five or six toll booths that are open but there are big queues at two of them because people are unduly responsive to the suggestions and behavior of others in situations where they're under great time pressure. So they'll all get on the same queue, even though three windows may be entirely open. This is also a reason why when there have been fires in clubs and movie theaters, bodies are often found stacked at the same would-be exit. Uh, People don't stop and think, well, if everybody's running there, maybe it would be better for me to try to go in the other, in the other direction, or people escaping from terrorist attacks and buildings. So we have lots of evidence from different situations that uh, time pressure is not very healthy in terms of our responses.
Great. <clears throat> Let me just see how many more hands are up. There's one, and I think we can do one last round okay. and just very, very quickly. Mateo, one. Or oh, we can, yes, let's do it like that. Yeah. during the First World War, even Stalin sometimes did not rise to the occasion, and yet uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy did. I'm wondering whether you would think that nuclear weapons constitute such a symbol that kind of psychologically makes leaders rise to the occasion in a way, despite the fact that conventional warfare might actually be even more deadly than nuclear weapons. And if this symbol is very strong, does it constitute, according to you, a norm that might be even stronger than Trump's or Kim's personality in that case. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there were a couple of hands, yes, in the back. Oh, good question. Yes, yeah. We're even moving towards mental theory. We're even moving towards mental uh, theory. Thank you. Um, a question regarding the... Oh, Arthur, in the back, Hi. yes. Hi. Who, who are you? Oh. What's your name? Oh, Adam. Adam. Um, my question is regarding your criticism of politicians, where you suggest they are <coughs> irrational and they are likely to um, act based on impulse. Now, if we look at scholars, they are people who are unaccountable to anyone, but rather their own peers. And do you think that is a good thing, particularly on nuclear issues, where if we leave such decisions to them, they are unaccountable to anyone, and they're sort of... Um, because there's really that lack of accountability to the general public, unlike the politicians whom we can criticize as warmongers or, or whatever is the word. So would you argue that it's best to leave it to scholars and policymakers? Yeah. Okay. Is there anyone else? Last chance? Okay, I'll, I'll take these in. Okay, good. All right, so let's start with uh, Lisa. And your question is about social science and IR relative to risk and uncertainty and singular events. Uh, there's a vast room for social science to acquire knowledge and knowledge that's useful to policy. Uh, what will not work is the way positivists approach it, uh, to believe that there are general laws uh, or to believe that through correlations uh, they can make predictions of what will happen in the future. Uh, the best case in point is, I mean, think about the Correlates of War project, which has been going on for a very long time toward this end. And John Vasquez, who's a fine scholar and one of the people who grew up working in this tradition, a few years ago assessed uh, 60 years of Cal and found that its most significant finding was that states that border one another are more likely to go to war than states who do not. Huh? Well, you know, my grandmother could have told you this. Huh? And even if we have it, it doesn't mean that all states that border each other go to war. Uh, some do, some don't, some have good relations. Some at one point have had bad relations and gone to war. Now some have very good relations and don't, and who knows, it might go back uh, the other way. These things are context dependent. And this, I think, is the fundamental point made by Max Weber, who's my guide to how you do um, social science. And Max Weber argued that all events are singular events. And all events are singular events, not only because some of them, like the Reformation, only happen once, huh? but even events that are seemingly repetitive in their category, like arms races or trade disputes, they all take place in context. And ultimately, what determines an outcome 
are idiosyncratic features of this context. And this may be what else is happening at the same time. Huh? Oh, what leaders are in power, what their goals are, huh? what accidents and confluences uh, take place. And all of these things are outside our theories. So make the analogy to evolution, a very robust scientific theory accepted, I guess, everywhere but some Republican states in the United States. Uh, evolution makes no predictions. Uh, it's basically an historical science that will explain what has happened according to the robust mechanisms of evolution that scientists beginning with Darwin have <laughs> developed. So if we think of social science more like evolution or like clinical medicine, whatever scientific understandings we think we might have huh, are nothing more than starting points of narratives about the future. And rather than making predictions what social science should be doing, <laughs> is making forecasts. And forecast says, I think that this is the most likely outcome. Uh, and if it happens, here's the pathway by which it will happen. And what I would need to know five hours, five days, five years from now, depending on the situation, this is the information I would have to have to either increase or decrease my confidence that we're moving along this pathway. And a good forecast says, here are other possible outcomes, and here are the pathways to them. And it works from the assumption that my preferred likely outcome is probably going to be wrong. It's the nature of the world. The Oedipus effect is always in play here because multiple people are interacting in ways with an aggregation effects that we don't know. So you have to spell out these pathways and even having some un very unlikely outcomes but stipulating beforehand what information you would need to increase or decrease your confidence in any of them. And then you're in a situation to engage in steering, to change your mind and your policy as you have the information, and possibly doing so in ways that leads to better outcomes. Now, this is how social science should function and should be useful. And if we did this as opposed to what rationalist modelers do, which is thinking that the world is rational, and Max Weber here too said, models must be rational, but people aren't. Uh, we would make ourselves more germane to the policy world. Uh, now, um, that was Lisa. Matteo, uh, is there a difference between nuclear weapons and conventional weapons? And as you nicely put it, the casualties of conventional wars could seemingly even be higher, but people tend not to be deterred from them the way they are frightened by, by nuclear war. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that this fear is important, but let's come back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We know that Kennedy and McNamara were very clear that until the very end of the crisis, they were thinking about, and even at the end of the crisis, conventional war. It never occurred to them that this conflict would become nuclear. And the horror of a conventional war, given their memories of World War II, was quite sufficient uh, to make them wary. And the same was true on the Soviet side, whereas we all know uh, the Soviets <laughs> suffered uh, casualties in World War II, all out of proportion to what everybody else uh, suffered. So I'd be careful about making that, uh, that uh, carrying that argument too far. As for norms, well, so people like Nina Tannenwald, a uh, former student, and others um, have argued for a strong existence of a nuclear norm. Uh, others, uh, TV Paul, have, uh, have, have questioned um, this. I think that the jury isn't in on it yet, uh, that the fact that weapons haven't been used may have, you could argue, may have less to do with a norm uh, 
than no leader ever finding a use for a weapon. So consider the United States, the longest standing nuclear power. In Korea, some generals urged Ike to use a nuclear weapon. And again, in Vietnam, to come to the aid of the French after Dien Bien Phu, the great defeat of the, the French. And Eisenhower said categorically no for two reasons. The first was there were no targets for which nuclear weapons were useful. He just didn't see any military use to them. And secondly, he said, if for the second time we use nuclear weapons against another Asian country, he said American influence in the Far East will amount to zero. So there are strong political reasons not to do it. Huh? And it wasn't that there was a taboo. And the same is true with what we know about the Soviet Union or Israel or China. No country has found any military purpose for using a nuclear weapon. Well, and in fact, it's a strong reason for not acquiring them. So I, I would be careful with, with the nuclear norm. Um, and the final question um, is Adam. And Adam, I think you understood my argument. Um, I am saying that uh, politicians do act on impulse and are more irrational and are more motivated uh, to make decisions in certain ways and ignore evidence than scholars may be. But nowhere did I ever suggest that scholars should make decisions. Uh, we, in democracies, have elected officials. And they're the ones, as you suggest, who have the ultimate responsibility for making decisions. What I'm suggesting is that scholars have not performed well in assessing uh, the question of luck, contingency, and risk. So they have not given good advice to policymakers. In fact, they've often given bad advice. To the extent to which scholars can have an input, it's in the form of advice, not in decision making. And it's that question of giving good and responsible advice to which I've addressed my talk. Great. Nate, thank you so much uh, for a fantastic talk, for answering all our questions, for a lot of uh, even meta theory, theory, methodology, and lots and lots of fantastic empirical illustrations as well. So I think we really deserve a big round of applause. Thanks for being here.